All right, uh, let's get started. I think this is the uh, final session of the day. So me and Gerge here is what's standing between you and, you know, beer and beaner schnitzel and all those nice things. <laughs> so we'll try to make this, if not short, at least entertaining, right? Um, if you look at the agenda, uh, let's move on. If it says that it should be Eleftheria and myself doing this. Uh, quite evidently, this is not Eleftheria. She is unfortunately stuck in Munich. Uh, and there's no trains leaving Munich for Vienna. So, uh, Gerge here accepted to come in and help out. So, here we have it, this guy. <laughs> He's also very, very competent. Of course, you know, yes. maybe not as good looking, but, you know, Definitely we'll not. take what we get. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is what life got you today. Yeah. <laughs> so, this talk is, first of all, a disclaimer. Uh, both me and Elfteria are lawyers. He's not a lawyer, but he's, you know, he's still a good guy. Uh, but to say that the opinions expressed in this presentation are our own and doesn't necessarily represent our companies. Uh, and this talk is based on an article me and Elfteria wrote uh, for IAM Magazine on efficient IP management in markets increasingly using open source, which is a fairly boring title. And IP in this sense doesn't refer to, to internet protocol, it refers to intellectual property. Um, and here is a QR code that works. We have tried it for this article. Uh, if In case you want to read it, I think you, know, you have to sign up. Oh, thank you, that's very nice. You have to sign up with an email, uh, but then, then you get to access it. And the moment, moment they start sending you spam, just unsubscribe. Uh, we also did a longer article uh, on this uh, where no one told us, you know, a, a limit on the number of pages that we could do. So if you did not get enough of the first article, you can read the same article, but three times longer if you use this link and this QR code. This QR code should maybe work. We'll, we'll see if someone tries it. If it doesn't work, reach out to me or lf 3 or Gergay and, and you will get a working link to it. Uh, so, what's our job? And our job as, as lawyers working in open source, it's of course, yes, it's being a lawyer, but it's also about being a guardian, being an enabler of open source in a company setting, solve problems, hopefully somewhat creatively. Um, it's a little bit about understanding the psychology and not only the psychology of the open source community, but also of the legal community and other parts of the company. And sort of being a, a translator between the various parts. And it's, it's also like you're embedded into this strange ecosystem and this strange tribe and culture that is open source. So it's, part, it's about being a cultural anthropologist as well. You, you're embedded into this tribe and you're studying it, how it works, what's its culture, what's its rituals like. Uh, and what I, what I would like to add, add to this, sorry to, to interrupt, like I'm working on the, let's say, other side of, of the lawyers. I am part of the, of the OSPO of Nokia, but I am not a lawyer and I'm working a lot with, with, with lawyers. And it is really true that if lawyers are dealing with open source, they have to be a bit of technologists. Like I did really compile containers with lawyers and explain them how the layers are working and they got it. Uh, and they also have to be like like um, uh, psycholo psychologists because they have to explain people why they cannot do something what they want to do. So it's a it's a very very diverse set of of knowledge what what lawyers working with open source people should should uh, should know. I think it's in a sense it's very different from working at a law firm or working uh, sort of elsewhere in a company. Because normally you're very sort of tied into your domain, but working with open source is sort of you're expected to get all of these other parts and function with all of these other parts as well. So I think it, it makes it fun. It makes it unique. Uh, it's certainly, you know, it's, I'm a terrible lawyer, so that's why I got into this because it's fun. <laughs> and those with sort of the real brains are off making real money anyhow. So it's it's a virgin field. So. Want to talk a little bit about like both me and Gary here work in, in the office, 
or in the open source program office of our respective companies. Uh, I work for Ericsson, Gerge for Nokia. So while we are in the same industry and fierce competitors, I mean, there are similarities as well. So when we discussed this leading up to this presentation, we said that this is originally one of my slides explaining like internally at Ericsson, what does our OSPO do and why do we have it? And it's like, well, it's, it's pretty much true for you guys as well, right? We just have uh, better colors, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. Um, so here, what we say is, you know, for us, we need to make consumption simple, easy, and at a low cost. That it, it needs to be simple to consume open source. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. You're losing engineering efficiency and so forth. And you need automation to make that happen at scale. And also, you lose your, your competitiveness. Like, if you are not using open source, then, then uh, your company just left behind because the whole industry is building so heavily in open source and relying on this like shared R&D. Let's say that if you are not consuming the results of, of this R&D machinery, then, then your R&D is just not effective enough. You cannot compete anymore with others in the, in the industry. And of course, it's true that you need to be there to contribute, you need to be there for technology leadership to push your vision. And the only way of doing that is actually by contributing parts of your technology stack into these projects. And, it, and what we want to do, and I think that's true for Nokia as well, is encourage small contributions such as bug fixes, because it's good for the ecosystem. It reduces your technical debt and your sort of um, increases engineering efficiency when you don't have to carry those local forks. But probably what's most relevant for our track here today and, and for this presentation is compliance. I mean, we can't do any of these things unless we have good compliance practices for open source. It's just a key element that needs to happen. Uh, but just one reflection before moving on from this slide is that, that it's, it's interesting in terms of consumption and contribution and well, compliance as well, that this is really true in a larger sort of open innovation ecosystem. We're, we're both from telco, we're big on standardization. Uh, building on standards such as 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, I mean, all of those are also sort of shared cost of innovation. So the same logic very much applies in that part of the industry as well, even if it's, you know, slightly different mindsets, slightly different culture and slightly different rules of, of engagement. That's why, I, that's why I wanted to reflect thing too in, in the contributing, like all industries heavily uh, relying on industry consensus because your phone have to work on any network. So we are very good in, in standardizing things and we love standardizing things. So this is why these, uh, these uh, big strategic contributions are also important for us because this is uh, a tool for us to, to reach um, industry consensus and open source and standards are complementing each other for our industry. So we are using both these let's say, tools to influence the industry in different parts. And that, that's very true. It, it's just two different tools in the open innovation toolbox that's, that exactly. we need to use and we need to master it sort of to stay competitive on the market. Uh, and if we look at sort of some volumes, just sort of give some, some flavor to sort of how much open source is being used. If we look at Ericsson, can look at the numbers, but what, what's really interesting is sort of the peak and the curve and, and sort of it's an ever increasing curve of how much open source we are reliant on in our products. Um, and these sort of, these numbers are for what it's worth. It's, it's unique components, new versions, but it also excludes open source content from commercial vendors. If for example, if we're sourcing Linux from Red Hat, then you know, that would not count among these. It also excludes some of the Ericsson subsidiaries that are not captured in these numbers. Uh, should I move on? Yes, I, th I think we have the, the same numbers or similar numbers. And, and I think what is important to recognize here are the trends. So regardless the company, uh, it's the same thing what is happening in the whole industry. The, the, the amount of open source uh, we are using is just increasing and increasing uh, year on year. So that's why it's very important to, to use automation because uh, without automation, your compliance process just cannot cope with the amount of open source what you use. So at, at one point you reach the, the tipping point when you are not able to, to handle the amount anymore. 
and also why do we care about IP? Why or why should we you care about when we talk about the IP? What does it matter? Uh, so both our companies rely heavily on IP or the entire telco industry really does. That, that's sort of the logic of how these standards were developed. It's the logic of how you get a return on your investment into these standards. That's sort of the prerequisite we made the investment into 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G is the fact that we rely on IP to make to recoup that investment in IP licensing. Uh, so for example, Ericsson has more than 60,000 granted patents. Nokia has more than 20,000 patent families. Um, and a patent family could consist of multiple patents. So the number is, is not directly comparable, but still we both have large IP portfolios and we both generate you know, significant revenue from, from our IP portfolios. Yes, and I think that what makes the OSPOs in our industry a bit unique, a bit different than, than in other industries, that we have to be very careful about, about IPs and uh, we have to always look at the different IP aspects when we are contributing or consuming open source. Yeah, so it, it's not just about sort of, can we expose this IP? Is this functionality we want out there? It's like, okay, is there underlying patents that are currently generating revenue that would be negatively impacted by us contributing into this project? So it, it's sort of an extra layer, an extra consideration that needs to be made. I think overall, like if, if we move into like the IP function, the patent people, those that, that sort of generate patent assets, monetize them and work with them strategically in the company. I would say at least this is, is representative of my journey with the IP department of sort of the awareness curve that they have. You pretty much start out here. We don't use open source, do we? Well, I think most will probably find that's not true. Probably use a lot of open source. You could see our numbers. It's uh, certainly been increasing. So the IP people move into anger. This is a risk. This comes with a royalty-free license or you're giving away our IP. We worked very hard to create this IP. Why are you giving it away in open source? So you move into the bargaining stage. Could we please stop using open source? What does this room think? Could we stop using open source? I'm seeing shaking heads. Yeah, that's probably true. So we're screwed. What should the IP function do? The open source people are giving away all our IP, all of our hard work. You know, what should we do? Hopefully, you'll reach the acceptance stage. But okay, we need to be smart about it. We need to develop strategies and processes to manage this and to, to leverage both the benefits of open source and the benefits of IP and ensure that they are harmonizing. That is easier said than done. And what we want to do in this presentation is sort of showing how you can use Open Chain as a tool to reach that position because ultimately you have the same goals as the IP department if, you're, if you work with open source uh, and open source compliance, it's about risk minimization, right? And it's about managing certain things. So hopefully we can use Open Chain as a framework to get to the acceptance stage. But let's be honest, I, I think sort of every organization probably you know, go back and forth between depression and, and acceptance. The more you learn about new challenges, the more you go sort of between them. That's certainly true for for me when we got like, for real started looking at generative AI, then I felt like we're very much back to where screwed stage. Hopefully, and now I think we're, we're closer to acceptance. It's a continuous learning process, which is always starts with depression and then you start like learning how to use these tools and you have to build your, your policies and processes to leverage on these new things. So third party IP dependency. This is just IP language for open source. In, in terms of IP, open source is just a third party IT depend, IP dependency that your company has. The IP in this case is copyright that someone has, and someone has brought into your company and you are now dependent on it. So this is, if you're bringing something with you from this conversation that you're, you take to your patent department, talk about third party IP dependency that you have that needs to be managed. And they need to take an active role in either managing or forming a strategy around. So. Yes, and, and as we discussed, like first, it can be like a, a scary for for the IP department, and they start to uh, like question, like, are we really using this much 
um, uh, open source? Are we really using this much of the license, uh, what we are talking about? And it, you can put any license here, you will get the same questions, because the, how the licenses are, are, are formulated uh, in the open source world are not according Le, uh, like the taste of the, the IP lawyers, but maybe... It, it, it's, it's not exactly legal best practices. It is here. not I exactly mean, if, if you go to law school, the first thing they would tell you is you need to have a governing law so that we know sort of how we should read this. It should be governing law US, governing law Sweden, whatever you want to have, right? Because that will tell you how we should interpret this. How many open source licenses has governing law? I mean, very, very few. And, you know, that's not a very good license legally, but whenever it's been tried, it's never really been successful. So apparently it doesn't make for a good open source license. It may, might make for a very good contract or a very good license otherwise, but for open source, for some reason that doesn't work. And that's just sort of a uncertainty that lawyers and IP departments need to be, become comfortable with that there is this degree of uncertainty. We don't know what governing law this has. And, and to do a short sidebar, Ericsson probably had the world's least successful open source license at one point that defined governing law, it defined where, where disputes should be solved, this was in the Stockholm Municipal Court, etc. Et it was the Erlang public license. Um, we changed that to Apache when we realized that, you know, it's 20 years, no other project has ever used this license, probably no other project will ever use this license, so we might as well change it to something people are comfortable and, and can use, right? And that was a major project. It was kind of fun. I can tell you that story over beer sometimes, uh, but we don't have time for it in this presentation. Uh, and the other question is like, well, I know this, this open source license, but can we negotiate with someone about this? I don't like this license. I want it under something else. I don't like GPL. Can't I you know, negotiate with someone on these terms? Typical answer, no, you can't. This is a community. You either take it or leave it. You can fork it if, if you don't like the content, but that doesn't really change the underlying license. So, it is what it is. And the other question, what usually uh, arises, like who signed the license, but of course nobody signed the license, but when you show that, okay, but there is this CLA, then the question is like, who signed this CLA? So you can never make them happy. Our lawyers, I mean. <laughs> well, the CLA is, is, is a funny story of its own, right? Who is supposed to sign it? Is it like a legal representative for a company? If so, there's a limited number of people that can do it. Is that something that typically can be, you know, delegated away? But it's, that's, that's a whole other story and a whole other mess. <laughs> but no, no one really signed this. You signed off on this when you started using it, when you created this third party IP dependency. And that's why it's so important that you manage this in a good way. So I believe you have a very important announcement to make. Yes, so as uh, OpenChain is helping us to create these processes and, and manage how do we relate to these processes. And it's very important for us to, to, to have these processes and, and like be compliant with the standard, we decided that Nokia would like to be compliant with the open chain uh, uh, compliance standard. And we today announced our compliance to the open chain. And thanks, Shane, for helping us during the process. So that was, uh, well, longer process than making a baby, but we managed to do it and now we have it. I think that's quite an achievement and, and congratulations on that. I, I've, I'm a little sad that it's not me making that announcement, but you know, we'll, we'll get there as well. I think this is sort of, it's good for the entire industry and, and for open source and telco in general that, that you guys are conforming. And I hope that that's going to fuel more, more companies. <laughs> yes, I hope too. Yeah, so how OpenChain helps us to, to build our, our, uh, our compliance. Uh, so OpenChain basically requires you to do a couple of things. First of all, you have to have an open source policy and you have to train your staff to know about this open source policy. Uh, and your policy should cover both uh, inbound and outbound parts of the, of the, of the compliance. So you should um, uh, have, let's say, a complete policy for everything that you do uh, with open source. Um, Oh, that's a bit too much. And um, you should document this, this policy. So that means that 
you are at least thinking about the policy you are you, you negotiate with within the company you know you, you really go through on this whole whole process of of creating a policies within the company um, and then you need to um, recheck yourself uh, regularly so it's not like it's not a single shot thing that you you are compliant and then it will stay with you forever but you have to maintain this this compliance so it's a it's a continuous effort to to be compliant and that's a very good property of the open chain and and should be added here as well open chain doesn't prescribe exactly how so i mean it doesn't tell you what open source policy you should have it tells you you should have an open source policy to do a stupid example you could have an open source policy that says we're not allowed to use open source at all within our company it would be a pretty bad open source policy but it would be sort of valid to the extent that you have an open source policy right so you have a lot of leeway in what your open source policy looks like so the standard is there to give you sort of the the what you should do but not how you should do it did i get that's that right chain and that's a very very important aspect because every company is different every environment is different so so it's very good that it gives you the, the freedom to to build your policy as you want to build it so it's it's a, it's not a bad thing it's a good thing yep so the ip issue and again the intellectual property issue with open source like uh sorry we have not managed to rehearse this for obvious reasons um, should you do this or should i yes yes so, okay. yeah so the issue uh issue of of uh, of ip with open source that first of all it's scary like uh lawyers dealing with with ips they do not know open source for for them it is like something what steals the ips or you know burns patents and these kind of things so it is a scary thing um then the the mindset uh, of IP people and, and open source is, is is different. So they are they are coming from a different angle to practice the same same thing because they have different uh, different missions. So uh, the open source communities are are built on like sharing sharing or or um, uh, thinking sharing or or ips or even uh, uh, copyright licenses while ip uh, ip lawyers or ip people are, are you know they they are about keeping things for a while so it's not not about that that open so it's a bit different a different issue different mindset and as we discussed before also um, they use a bit different language to describe the things that are different let's say dialects <laughs> there um, and um, it's difficult to manage uh, uh, copyright, but maybe you can explain why is that? I, I can explain that. Copyright is not, unlike a patent, you need to apply for a patent, you need to register it, you have a number, you have something that represents right. A copyright, it happens when you create a copyrightable work. You don't actually have to register it anymore. You don't even have to put the C mark on it. It, it happens when a cop when something worthy of copyright is created, then, then copyright happens, right? So in that sense, it's hard for a company to have a database of all the copyrights it's owned because it simply doesn't know what its employees have created. So it's very hard to manage that. And open source is, of course, mainly about copyright. So it, it becomes hard for an IP department to understand, okay, how do we manage open source as an IP asset because copyright is the main asset here and, and there's no register of copyright. We don't really know who owns what, etc. Compared to a patent where you would just, oh, you can move on slide. Uh, compared to a patent where you would just like, okay, it's this patent number, it's this inventor, it's assigned to this company. Very easy to manage comparatively. Exactly, but how do we um, solve these issues? Like scariness, it can be solved by education. So we have to work together with our IP department and, and teach them and let them to teach us. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's a multi-direction uh, exercise because both of us have a lot of things to, to, to learn from each other. Um, the cultural difference 
can be can be solved by by having a common common uh, interest and the recognition that we have the same uh, aim. So we would like to make our company successful. We are just using different tools uh, to do that. We are working in a bit different environment, therefore, um, or or targets are a bit different. But the main mission is the same for both of us. So we are talking different language, so we can solve this again with uh, education and listening to each other. So go to your IP department, talk to people, try to organize a regular sync up with, uh, with the IP department. It's very important for them also to know what is trending in open source and what contributions your company is making. And it's also very important for you to learn what, the, what are the areas where your company is, uh, is creating patents and what are the areas where your company is having licensing programs. So this is um, uh, a necessity to, to manage this risk, what we were talking about, that both of you know what the other is, is doing because you are working for the same organization eventually. Yeah, and, and also here, it's open chain is a super useful tool to sort of align around some key concepts that you can start to build this trust and this common language and, and education around. Yes, it's a, it's a good framework to do that. So different missions, of course, um, you can, you can uh, teach uh, about the value of open source. You can teach the IP department how much your company gains uh, with open sources, how much your company can do in open source to influence the industry uh, and to, you know, be, be part of the ecosystem. So you are basically sharing um, uh, the same mission. You are just using different tools again for achieving the same goal. Yeah, and, and both parties probably have valuable business intelligence for the other side that that should be transacted, should be shared. Uh, and sort of will make everyone's life easier if, if, if you have a sort of good knowledge transfer between them. And it's also the value of patents in open source. It, it might not be obvious, but probably the right number of patents to have is not zero. Probably the right number of patents to have is not a million either for a project. So it, it's somewhere in between and you need to have sort of a strategy and a way of determining what's the right number of patents to have on a project. Just because there is an open source project doesn't mean that the value of these patents are zero, so we shouldn't pay annuities for them and just kill them. That, that's probably not true. There's probably some value and it might be useful sort of to protect the project, to protect against proprietary interests or to sort of drive innovation in, in other areas. So having sort of that discussion, I think it, it's, it's super useful. Yes, and it also helps you to learn each other's language. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, different ideology. I think that's the same, same story again, like you have the same goal eventually. You just have to sit down and discuss how do you achieve that goal together, even though you are operating in a totally different environment, you can have a common strategy what you are executing in your own domain. It's a, and it's a must if you would like to be effective as a company who is licensing IPs. Yeah, and it, it's about setting, like we're about bringing value to the company. We bring value to the company by either by, by patents and IP or by open source. So how do we align those so that we can bo use both of these tools efficiently so that we're not sabotaging each other's work? I think that's, that's the important part to align on, to sort of see that, well, IP can bring value. It's not about educating on patents are bad, because that's, that's not a receptive audience for that. And honestly, I don't think they necessarily are that either. I think they're a tool in a toolbox for a company to use. It's about how do you use them strategically with the commercial reality that a lot of your stack is open source. And a lot of your third party IP dependencies are open source. Yes, uh, managing copyrights, I think you discussed that already. So, 
relevance of open source compliance to IP management. So if we tie this back in, into the open chain specification, um, have an open source policy. Okay, so company's position towards third party IP dependency. That, that's what this policy means for, for an IP department. What is our policy towards how we accept and how we manage third party IP dependencies? Staff receive training related to open source. Okay, that's understanding of third party IP dependencies to make informed decisions. That could be an informed decision on risk management, on patent filing, on a number of things, but you need to, to have tra received training to be able to make that. No one, no, not even anyone in this room understood open source until they've been exposed to it, right? It's not in our genes. It's in our genes to collaborate, but the whole open source ecosystem is something you have to learn and experience over time. Compliance process covering inbound open source software. Okay, so in IP management terms, that's ensuring management of IP risk is already taken care of at the intake stage. It's about risk minimization. By having a policy for your inbound, you, you already accept, okay, we accept these risks, but we don't accept these risks. Compliance process for internal development. Ensuring management of IP risks in each specific use case so that you have that in place. Oh, sorry, someone wanted to take a picture. I can go back. <laughs> okay. Then compliance processes for outbound products and services. If we translate this again, it's ensuring managed IP risk for our shipped products. And ultimately that's what an IP department is about. Managing the IP risks of the products that we ship so that we can do business in a reasonable manner. Then process for outbound open source contributions. Well, ensuring no intended IP leakage. And that goes equally for trade secrets, for copyrights and other things that might be valuable for the company, just, not just patents. And documentation on how this is accomplished. Well, ultimately that's about covering your own ass. So, uh, do you want to do this one? Yes, um, so I think what we need to teach to each other and what IP department should um, uh, understand together with the OSPO is that uh, open source is here. We cannot avoid open source because if you avoid open source, your company is going down. Uh, but the, the IP department is helping the OSPO team. So they are not, not, not enemies within the company. They are, they are allies in the company and we should work together with the IP team and together the OSPO team and the IP team to work towards the same, same goal and um, that is to reduce the risk of using open source because we cannot avoid using open source. What we would like to do is to, to um, leverage, the disk, uh, leverage the risk of using open source. Um, and that's, um, that's what results, uh, let's say, a mature IP department. And that, that's what um, you can achieve by a continuous discussion between the OSPO and the IP department and, and have a common strategy to to achieve your goals. I, I think most here is probably familiar, at least seen this slide before in terms of like the OSPO maturity model. And of course, the more mature the OSPO, the easier things get as well. But let's, everyone's seen this already. So we can move into like the IP department maturity model. It doesn't look as nice because we haven't spent time on this, <laughs> but, but still, I mean, sort of the, if, if, you're, if your IP department is a stage four, they are a strategic bus business decision-making partner then it's easier to have these conversations on we're active in this project, we want to push this technology or we need to use this open source project. How do we do that? That becomes a lot easier than if your IP department is at the IP, they have an IP strategy and they, they don't just patent anything that comes across their desk. They understand a little bit about the patent. But obviously it's going to be a lot easier to have that conversation that is quite you know, sophisticated actually between the OSPO and the IP department if you have an IP department at the stage four. Of course, you have to work with what you got. So it, it, it takes time to get there. And I think we're all sort of iterating to get to the point where we're, we're either at stage four or could stay at stage four because that's, that's a continuous evolution, a continuous journey. Same for an OSPO. No OSPO is sort of always in all aspects sort of on top. That, that's, it's a journey to get there. Yes, but I think the OSPO can help the IP department to, to, to reach like a higher stage by asking questions, like going there, okay, can I do this? Can we do that? How do we achieve this together? So that like starts a thinking process about these kind of things and it elevates 
the, the IP department in the maturity model. Absolutely, and being there asking some tough love questions. What are you actually going to use this patent for? Or why do we have all these? What value are they bringing, right? Yes, and uh, about this whole compliance process. So why do we need uh, like a systematic view of, of compliance? It's uh, because it's, a, it's a, like a circular system which practically um, affects your whole uh, company. So you should be able to, to have a compliance system uh, which allows you to securely cons cons um, consume third-party dependencies because that's what you need to do to be able to use open source in your, your products. And you should be able to um, safely integrate this into your products because um, uh, without that you cannot be sure that uh, you are not doing something wrong, so you have to like cover your ass. <laughs> uh, but also, as we discussed, you, sh you have to be able to contribute back. Even if you are not doing strategic contributions, when you are integrating open source to your product, surprise, it will be part of your product. So if you have a bug, you should be able to fix that bug, and you should be able to fix that bug in a way that, uh, let's say, you are not scared of the process, so you are uh, carefree in the sense that you know what you can do and what you cannot. And this is why a, a good uh, compliance process is helping you and the whole company that it basically allows the company to do things. It allows the company to know what you can or what you cannot do. And that's, uh, that's the, the, the big value of OpenChain, that it forces you to, to, to basically create your own boundaries. Um, and then, of course, uh, you should you should take care of the of the supply chain. So you should have like a good supply chain management to get your own changes back, basically, or be sure that uh, what you consume is what you supposed to consume. So that's why it's important part of the of the compliance system. And that gets us again back to Open Chain. Why Open Chain? Well, it's a community. You, so you don't have to do all of this yourself. It's, you know, actually don't just talk about it, you know, actually do it. But I mean, with less talking, it, it sort of define your industry. If, if, your indus if OpenChain is not yet big in your industry, I mean, a couple of years ago, Telco wasn't really a thing with OpenChain. Now Nokia is, is conformant. Ericsson is on the OpenChain board. Uh, there are several other telco companies adopting this. We have significant tractions with the Open Chain Telco Guide. So, you know, that allows you to shape your industry and determine what are good com compliance practices in my industry. The worst thing you can have happen to you in terms of that is probably having your customers try to define what is good compliance practice. Because all your customers will probably have very different ideas of what good compliance practices are. So by being engaged in the open chain community, you can say, look, this is what should count as good compliance in our industry. So being proactive there. And having an ISO standard also brings a level of credibility. So when you talk to sourcing or supply or sales, saying we have an ISO number. To them, that means something. For us, it's just a boring number, right? But for them, it's actually really, really important. And you don't have to do it all of, on your own either. I mean, there is a wonderful community, many of them in this room, in the Open Chain community, that works very hard to bring you guides, um, talks, um, the specification. We have any number of monthly meetings. Shane is here if you have any questions. He's general manager of the project. And I, I think that's probably my favorite part about OpenChain and our own journey to, to adopt that is the fact that we don't have to do it alone. It's, it's a community journey of doing so. That brings us to Q&A, but I think we're out of time. But if someone <laughs> has questions, we're certainly around. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ravi. I have a question related to compliance, whether open chain defines or tells to what level you need to be compliant. Like example, if you take a dependency, the dependency can have a transitive dependencies going deep down. And it is, it's also possible that engineering teams or developers may start using individual files rather than using the packages. Or it could also be possible that they may be using some code snippets. So just wanted to understand, are you? 
No, open chain doesn't define that. So that's up to your sort of um, open source policy to define to which level you should be. There's other things that that do define that, but in the specification, that's not defined. But that's also there's a lot of things that aren't defined in the specification. So the value is that you understand that someone has sort of a base level that is open chain. Then you can of course exchange artifacts as they're known in the specification. So, okay, you, you tell me you have an open source policy, that, that tells me something. But okay, let me see your open source policy because then, then I can verify, right? So it, it gives you transactable objects that you can then use to verify how are they conformant to this specification. It's one thing that they are conformant, but how are they conformant? The specification, as it doesn't tell you how you should be conformant. Other questions? I certainly will not hold it against anyone if they want to leave. I would want to, after <laughs> listening to us for 40 minutes. But if anyone has further questions. So that, that's just, I, I come from an IP background and I, I sort of know where the Ericsson IP department was 20, 25 years ago. It was, you know, there wasn't a real strategy of what we filed patents on, how we filed them, where we filed them. It was basically, this seems like a good idea, let's file a patent on it. And that's of course, you know, w at best you end up with something useful. At worst, you have wasted a lot of money because you, you filed the wrong claims, you filed in the wrong area, you filed in the wrong countries. So stop just doing it ad hoc, have a strategy of what you're doing. I guess everyone really wants to leave because I don't see any raised hands. <laughs> With that. Thank you.